this book is called When the Body Says No. A British cellist, uh, her name is Jacqueline Dupre. You know something about her? Yeah. Jacqueline Dupre was a virtuoso and a child prodigy. So, I mean, she played in Toronto here. She's British, but she was an international star. I mean, she played here in Toronto when she was 21 years old. People actually cried at her performance. They cried at her performance because her music was so emotional. She, wa she wasn't a typical sedate classical musician, you know. She, when she played, her whole body was into the music. She swayed her long blonde hair, flew in the air, and she poured all her emotions into her music. In fact, they talked about her cello voice, where she expressed all her emotions through her cello, but not in her real life. In her real life, she did not express emotions at all. She suppressed herself. She ended up with multiple sclerosis. By the time she was 27, she couldn't play anymore because she couldn't hold the bow anymore. So her career was very short. And you know what? She never wanted to become a virtuoso. She said, I don't want to become a child virtuoso. She said, because it killed me. She knew it. And it did kill her. But she said, I can't give it up because so many people will be so disappointed if I did. And that's why she continued. When she was seven or eight, she said to her sister, Hillary, who also became a musician, not as great as Jackie was. Hill, she says, don't tell our mommy this, but when I grow up, I won't be able to move or walk. That's what happened. She became paralyzed with multiple sclerosis. She was seven or eight, she said, don't tell our mommy this, but when I grow up, I won't be able to move. Now, what do you notice about that? If you were seven or eight years old, or, or, let me put it this way, if you had a child that was seven or eight, and they were afraid that they won't, when they grow up, they'll be paralyzed, who would you want them to talk to about that? If you were the parent, you wanted them to talk to you. But by age seven or eight, she knew that she had to protect her mother. She was a virtuoso, a prodigy, so she went to Russia, the land of classical music, to further her education. She was raped there. When she came, when she came back to Canada or to, you know, to Britain, she said to her sister, "Hill, don't tell our mummy this, but I was raped in Russia." Now, why? It's because when she was born, still in the maternity hospital with her mother, her mother's father died. And her mother, who was a very troubled person herself, very close to her father, was totally grief-stricken. And guess what role the baby was given? What's that? To cheer her up, to be the mother's emotional support. So Jackie never was allowed to be her own person. She had to be like an extension of the mother. But her job was to support the mother emotionally. So they had a symbiotic relationship. And that's why she was always protecting her and not disappointing. The story of Jacqueline Dupre, I, I, I talk about it in uh, the second chapter of this book, When the Body Says No. And um, let me read you this paragraph here. 20 years after her childhood debut, now ill with multiple sclerosis, Jackie told a friend what she had felt on first finding herself on stage. Quote, it was as if until that moment she had in front of her a brick wall which blocked her communication with the outside world. But the moment Jackie started to play for an audience, the brick wall vanished and she felt able to speak at last. It was a sensation that never left her when she performed. So the only time she could express herself was when she was on stage. And every other way she suppressed herself. In a marriage, in a relationship with her parents, she surpassed herself. Her sister said she was always the Jackie that circumstances demanded. So she was not herself. It was not authentic. It was always about the attachment. A composer called Edward Elgar. Elgar was in his 60s when he wrote this, and this happened during the First World War. And, it was, and the First World War was a time of terrible disillusionment, terrible carnage terrible trauma. 
tens of thousands of young people being killed every day in France in those terrible trench battles. And Elgar, the composer, was completely despondent. And he said, everything good and nice and clean and fresh and sweet is far away never to return. He wrote that in 1917, when he wrote the concerto. He was in his seventh decade in the twilight of his years. And his sister writes, sorry, her sister writes, Jackie's sister writes in the biography of her sister, Jackie's ability to portray the emotions of a man in the autumn of his life was one of her extraordinary and inexplicable capacities. Well, my comment is extraordinary, yes, but it's not inexplicable. Because by the time she was in her 20s, by, by the time she recorded this piece when she was 20 years old, or 21 years old, Jackie was already in the twilight of her life. Within a few years, she wouldn't be able to play the cello anymore. And by the time she was in her early 40s, she would die of multiple sclerosis. And she knew that. Something inside her knew that already. She understood Elgar because she had partaken of the same suffering. His portrait always disturbed her. He had a miserable life, Hill, she told her sibling, and he was ill, yet throughout it all, he had a radiant soul, and that's what I feel in his music. Now, who do you think she was talking about? She was talking about herself, but she didn't recognize that. After she died, her sister listened to a performance of the same concerto on the BBC. It had been Jackie's final performance, public performance in Britain. A few moments of tuning, the sister writes, a short pause, and she began. I suddenly jumped. She was slowing the tempo down. A few more bars, and it became vividly clear. I knew exactly what was happening. Jackie, as always, was speaking through her cello. I could hear what she was saying. I could almost see tears on her face. She was saying goodbye to herself, playing her own requiem. So then the question then is, how do these traits of suppressing emotions, not saying no, taking on responsibility for everybody else, not expressing your own needs, um, how do they lead to illness? Well, they lead to illness and, and, and burnout because physically they affect the body. They affect the body because it's now known that the mind and body can't be separated. So. Western medicine, which has got great achievements, uh, obviously, in many, many ways, miraculous in some ways, however, still falls into the deep error of separating the mind from the body. So when you, as I said earlier, when you go to the doctor with a rash, nobody's going to ask you about your life. And yet that rash says everything about your childhood and everything about how you live your life right now. When you go to the doctor with uh, inflammation, you go to the doctor with uh, inflammation of your joints, they're not going to ask you about your relationships, about your work, about um, what you take on, because we separate the mind from the body.